Now, broadcasting on Rockstar Worldwide from the Double Wide Production Studios, this is the Home Movie Legacy Project with your host, Rhonda Vigent. I got an camera. I love to take a photo. guests will share home movie stories that will tug at your heartstrings. You'll learn how to organize, digitize, share on social media, and use your home movies as genealogy research. Learn how to repurpose or even monetize found footage. This is the Home Movie Legacy Project. And now, here's your host, Rhonda Vigent. Welcome everybody to the Home Movie Legacy Project. We focus on exposing real solutions to create a media legacy that lives. Uh, it's Thursday, my favorite day of the week, and I hope it is yours too because we get to spend the next hour together talking about all kinds of interesting stuff about taking your media from the past, bringing it into the present so it'll be there for the future. I had a great but crazy week last week. Uh, we had two shows that we were doing. One was called Jamboree, which is a genealogy conference sponsored by the Southern California Genealogy Society. And at the same time, we were at Cine Gear Expo celebrating uh, Kodak's 50th, uh, uh, Super 8's 50th birthday with Kodak in their amazing booth. They had a little Airstream there. We were on the Paramount back lot. It's the biggest trade show for gear in, ho in Hollywood. And it's always the first weekend in June. And so because Super 8 was turning 50, Kodak said we're going to put on a big Super 8 birthday party. And, of course, we have to have Rhonda and Phil and everybody from Pro 8 Millimeter there. And it was a lot of fun. We brought a bunch of Super 8 cameras, let people shoot some film. And, you know, it's pretty kind of almost emotional and moving to see some of these old guys, you know, well, I'm almost one of them now, too, old guys and gals, but, you know, ASC cinematographers who had their whole career on film, most of who started on Super 8 because that was the camera they had available to them. And I got a photo with one of my favorite guys, Vilmos uh, uh, Zygmunt from, uh, he did Easy Rider, and uh, a Hungarian filmmaker, uh, another filmmaker client of ours, James Chrysanthus, had done a documentary about him called No Subtitles Necessary, and it was about how these two Hungarian filmmakers had migrated here, or I should say escaped here from Hungary uh, during, you know, the Nazi invasion. So all very emotional, you know, to be part of such a huge legacy of film on film and to be there at the Paramount lot celebrating 50, 50 years of Super 8. Uh, so, I don't know, I just kept going back and forth between that conference and the one in Burbank. Uh, Jamboree, as I said, is sponsored by the uh, Southern California Genealogy Society. It's like a little mini Roots Tech, if you've ever been to Roots Tech in Salt Lake City. And my session was called um, Sprocket to Me, uh, Using Your Home Movies and Your Genealogy Research. And I always love it when I get to speak live in front of a crowd and get to like look in the eyes of people and they get, I get to see their reactions when I actually show them some archival footage because you know you see how people just really resonate with it how they get very very attached to it and uh, so you know with that being said I think some of you know anyways I'm a home movie educator I have um, launched in the past an eight-week series on um, home movie education, how to take care of your home movies, how, whether or, you know, if you're in the photo organizing business, like a lot of our APPO members are, you know, it's just a great way how to learn all the things you need to know about your film. I'm going to be relaunching that eight-week series in October, and uh, if you go to my website, homemovielegacy.com, you can sign up for the class. It's going to be $298, but uh, between now and August 15th, I'm going to have an early bird schedule for just $198. So I just want to quickly go through what the eight modules are. The first one's called Sprocket to Me, where you learn to identify all the different film formats um, and so you, even obscure formats so you can figure out what you have in the collection. The second one's called Cutting Through the Red Tape, where you learn how to do the same thing with your tape collection. Module 3 is called The Whole Nine Yards, Solutions for Calculating Footage. So you want to figure out how much footage you have, particularly if you're setting a budget for your archive or someone in your families. Module 4 is called See What Condition My Condition's In, where we talk about how to evaluate the, um, the condition of your film and tape because uh, there are all different kinds of deterioration that happen, both biological, mechanical, and for mishandling of human beings. So we want to talk about that. Um, module 4 is called It's a Kodak Moment, 
as opposed to a Kodak moment, play on words there, where you want to learn about the different um, wrappers or extensions you want to put on your film when you bring it into your digital world, how to work with them. Module 6 is called How Scantastic, and you're getting a little preview of that today when I bring on my special guest in a few minutes. We talk about scanning technology and all the different ways you can get that analog material moved into your digital world. And then Module 7 is called Is the Flow a Go? Uh, because we always need to think about our workflow, how we're going to work with our media before we start editing it. And then um, the final one, uh, Module 8, is just called Application. So, Again, it's going to start in October for eight Tuesdays, uh, all through the month of October and November, $298. But if you go to HomeMovieLegacy.com and sign up before August 15th, it'll be $198. So come and join our class and learn even more uh, about how to handle your archival media. So as we know, and the reason we do this show, you know, media is in a constant state of evolution and we always have new things coming on the market that we want to at least know something about before we start to move our digital assets or remove them because, you know, the one thing that's inevitable is that it's not a one-time forget it and, th and do it and forget it thing. Uh, as the years go by and technology has its inevitable changes, uh, you're going to want to move your media again. So um, today I'm having my expert guest, Phil Vigent, my unofficial co-host, uh, on the show. And today we're going to share with you the next wave in scanning film to data files. So Phil, welcome. Hi, Rhonda. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. You know, I'm glad you're here today. I. I originally I had another guest scheduled, I won't lie, <laughs> and we were going to talk about his new surf film that was shot on Super 8, but surf must have been up because he's uh, gone missing. Yeah, surf guys are like that. You know, they, they definitely move to the, uh, to the rhythm of the ocean, so you never know what's going to happen with uh, one of those surf players uh, if the uh, waves are good. You exactly. Know? Well, I'm sure we'll get him on because I know he's got a Kickstarter going, so yep. I'm glad you're here. We weren't going to do this show for a few weeks but there's no time like the present, right? Yeah, yeah, you got to take care of it. Right, right. So, little birdie told me Pro 8 millimeters getting a new scanner. What's all that about? Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, like you say, a constant evolution process. So, uh, we're always experimenting with new things. We're always trying uh, new angles uh, and, and trying to bridge that gap between uh, what the consumers have uh, in their collections and what the studios have and what the studios are doing. So as they morph their workflows and they change their minds about uh, how to better manage uh, their pictures, uh, we're always uh, right there behind them uh, looking at ways that we can take that advantage of that same kind of technology uh, and apply it to 8mm uh, and super and 16mm film. Right. So uh, what's been evolving uh, over the last uh, probably three to five years in the professional sector uh, is to, to take a different approach to scanning film uh, to digital. And that approach basically is to try to get all the information uh, from the film to digital without really paying that much attention to how good it looks in the digital. And I, I know that sounds kind of strange that you would want to make a transfer and you wouldn't care what it looked like in the end. But uh, from a technical standpoint, if you could capture all the information that's on the film, uh, unencumbered by someone who's trying to be creative and trying to color correct it and trying to do things with it to make it look good, but just capture all the information digitally. Um, if you had you know, file sizes that were big enough to do this job, and, and part of why this was never done in the past is that you just didn't have enough digital space mm -hmm. and powerful enough computers to uh, to process images that way, you had to use a limited quantity of uh, information from the film because the film just has so much, uh, and the digital systems of the past could only manage so much. So, time has evolved here, and and what's come in the evolution is the ability of computers to make larger and larger f film size, so they digital sizes, so that they can store uh, all the information that's on a piece of film. So what the studios do is, and have been doing over the last few years, is they do something they call data scanning, um, which is different in, in mostly in the sense that you're trying to get the data 
off the film, not the pictures off okay. the film. Okay. So you're trying to get all the information that's on the film on digital. And this is done using different types of techniques than you would if you're trying to look at something in terms of trying to make the best picture. So one thing they do is something called a log scan. So a log scan is different from a regular scan in that uh, if you were to look at the picture, it would look like a very uncontrasty, uninteresting uh, kind of image. Um, but by, by shaping a picture digitally that way, with a log uh, of the picture, rather than trying to make the full contrast in the digital, you can take all the information off film and get it to digital. So a log transfer is a typical thing done um, for a major you know, production these days in Hollywood. Just get the information to digital, and then we'll play with it in digital after we have it there. But isn't that labor intensive? Well, in, in the past, it was horribly labor intensive, and so um, most people avoided doing that. But inventions have keep coming out in the computers. And so uh, in a typical computer today, like uh, um, an Apple computer, uh, if you had the program Final Cut X, the new version, uh, you would have a full color correction suite inside of your edit program. So now you have the capacity at home to do your own color timing. And so what does that do? Okay, it's not being done by a professional, so you have to learn a little bit about it. But Apple has made it so easy and convenient that it's really not that difficult for a person who's doing editing to also be doing some color timing of their material. So with those programs being available to you on a consumer level, I mean Final Cut X, uh, <laughs> it, 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 it's unbelievable. You're, you're buying a program that costs $300. Are you kidding? That's all? That's all. It's replacing something, let's say that we used 15 years ago, like an avid editor, which at that time cost 75 or 100,000. It's replacing a Da Vinci color corrector, which costs two or three hundred thousand dollars, and you've got all this technology you're buying for three hundred dollars, and you've got it in your little laptop that you bought for fifteen hundred bucks, and uh, and you really can access a lot of this kind of you know, which was heavy duty Hollywood kind of uh, you know effect kind of work uh, in your own laptop, so. A lot of people are realizing and, and buying their own systems so that they can do these types of things. And so they really want the raw information. They don't want the film to be pre-timed by somebody else. They want to be able to be the masters of their own universe and do their own color time. That's amazing. All right. Well, hang in there, everybody. We're going to find out more about this you know, real big shift in the uh, film to digital scanning. When we get back after this break, you won't want to go away. Raising the consciousness as to why home movies are so important. This is the Home Movie Legacy Project with Rhonda Vigent. And we'll be back with more right after these on Rockstar Worldwide. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for you to create indestructible wealth. Get ready for wealth with Paul Mata and create indestructible wealth. Learn how to make, sustain, and protect your wealth in any economy. Listen live every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern and on demand 24-7 right here on Rockstar Worldwide. Paul Mata is the creator of the system for creating indestructible wealth. Paul will share easy tips and strategies on how you can grow all of your assets so you can live an abundant and prosperous life. Each high-energy show will feature interviews with experts who will help you on your path to creating indestructible wealth. For more on Paul, the show, and his Create Indestructible Wealth boot camps, check out Create Indestructible Wealth with Paul Mata or go to createindestructiblewealth.com. Learn how to make, sustain, and protect your wealth in any economy so you can live an abundant and prosperous life with a passion to serve others. 
Are you excited about getting your home movies and photos organized, but don't know where to start? Well, the Association of Personal Photo Organizers, www.appo.org, can help. The photo organizers are made up of a community of people. They're organizers, photographers, graphic designers, storytellers, historians, people just like you who love photos, home movies, and most importantly, the stories they tell. Through training, education, networking, and collaboration, the Association of Personal Photo Organizers strives to advance this new and growing profession of photo life management. Our hundreds of trained personal photo organizers specialize in helping you rescue your irreplaceable photos and home movies and organize them in ways that make it simple to share your memories, lives, and traditions. Our goal is to help you make those distant memories tangible so you can cherish the life that you share with others. If you need help, look for a personal photo organizer near you by going to appo.org. We are excited and ready to help. Welcome back to the Home Movie Legacy Project, showcasing compelling interviews with people who are telling their personal stories. Rhonda is all about preserving our visual heritage for generations to come before it's too late. So let's get back to the show. It's the Home Movie Legacy Project on Rockstar Worldwide. And here again is your host, Rhonda Vigent. And welcome back to the show where we're talking with Phil Vigent today about trends in scanning your film to digital. And uh, we were talking about the new sort of evolution, the next generation of scanning, if you will, which is data scanning. Uh, so, Phil, uh, before we went to break, you were saying how people can now buy Final Cut X for $300 and do their old color timing. That's just amazing. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's it's fantastic that, that you have access to this kind of thing. Uh, and this is what modern, you know, kind of people are using in terms of, uh, um, you know, doing their own productions. And, and you really, if you're going to be in this kind of business, you have to understand these sort of elemental kind of things. So uh, other parts to this are, you know, these large data files. So um, what we're talking about is scanning film out not to SD and not to HD, but to 2K and to 4K and to even 5K. Um, digital so a lot files. Of K. Does anybody really care for the K? <laughs> <laughs> right. So um, you can only take advantage of this kind of technology if you start to think about using that kind of size. Now, uh, one thing that will be evolving for us with the new scanner is the ability to uh, compress 2K data while we scan. Right now, we can scan in 2K but it has to be an uncompressed scan. So it's a lot of information. Right, right. And so if we can get a compressed scan, like a ProRes scan uh, off of our machine, then uh, that makes the file sizes something that you know the average person can work with. So one other part of things like Final Cut X is that it's scalable. So it doesn't just work in standard definition or high definition, but it can work in 2K. It can work in 4K. So if you have Final Cut X, you can be editing a 4K uh, file right into your HD program. Um, or you can edit an SD thing into your 4K program. So you've got the ability to scale within Final Cut X, uh, which you didn't have in previous kind of programs. So you can take any size file, any shape of file, any data rate of file, and you can edit it in your timeline. So this is really opening up, you know, access for you of, of these incredibly, uh, you know, interesting new things. That's pretty amazing. So my question is this, if you're scanning files that big, how big a hard drive do you need? Like, let's say like just a typical Super 8 roll, 50 feet, you know, um, right now we're like at one gig a minute, two mm -hmm. gigs a minute. You know, by the time you're doing data scanning at 4K, 5K, well, this, I can't imagine how much hard drive space you would need. Well, this has much more to do with the compression. So that if you're doing fully uncompressed, like today we do fully uncompressed DPX 2K files of Super 8, that's 50 gigs for one roll of Super 8. So where, you know, you have, you know, ProRes is a gig a minute. Uh, this is 20 gigs per minute. So if you did them in 2K or 4K completely uncompressed, yeah, you'd be up to like 100 gigs a minute. But 
you're also going to have the option of getting your 4K compressed in ProRes. So you could do ProRes 422 4K, in which case you're going to be looking at 3 or 4 gigs a minute. So it's a little bit bigger than what we're doing now at a gig a minute. But it's not going to be like dealing with uncompressed files. You know, we're going to be able to put out um, information in 2K and in 4K in ProRes, which is something that's really usable in um, something like a, a laptop computer because you really can't use uncompressed data uh, unless you have a big server. Okay. Well, so we talked a little bit about the new scanner, and um, you know, one of the things that I'm curious about is how much, you know, we always said in the past, like with a telecine, okay, and people now ask me when they call, do you have a telecine or not, mm -hmm. um, that the best scan was coming native, you know, off the telecine, right. with the color correction native off the telecine. Correct. So explain how this is going to be different. Well, for the longest time, we, we worked towards having all the tools to make the picture that was coming off out of the, tele, out of the transfer room be as good as possible. And that meant a few things to us. First, it meant having proper color correction. So we had a Da Vinci color corrector to correct the color. But it also meant correct framing. So we were framing the picture for whatever output we were putting. So if we were making... Uh, normal Super 8 into high def. We we're framing a 4 by 3 picture with pillar boxes on the sides. So we we're also tracking the framing along with doing the transfer as well as doing the color and exposure correction. We were also doing things like um, dust busting on the film using the Y front technology to, to soften the look of the dirt and the scratches. We were also doing stabilization in high definition. So all these tools we were applying to your footage so that what you saw out of your roll of film was the best we could make it using all that equipment. With a data scan, the logic is different. We're trying to just scan the picture. We're over scanning the picture. So the frame that you see in video is going to not only see that frame, but the edges of the frame before it, the sprocket on the left, the frame and the, to the side. You're going to see beyond the physical piece of film in the data scan. You're going to have all the information that's on the film. And it's going to be, become your responsibility to do the color correcting, the framing, the dirt busting, and the image stabilization. These things will all become a function of post-production, not a function of a transfer. So why do studios do it this way? I mean, you, yeah, you, well. we're saying to ourselves, oh my God, uh, you know, I'm going to have to do much more work to make my home movies look as good. And yes, you will. You will have to do a lot more work. But what can be done is obviously that can be done much cheaper in the mm -hmm. scan stage. So when you're using the Millennium 2 that we have, it's a million dollar piece of equipment. There's a million dollars worth of technology in that room to try to make that picture that comes out of there look as good as it could look. With the data scanner, it's nowhere near that expensive a piece of equipment. And we're not doing all that work to the film. So we can basically lace the film up on it hit the automatic buttons to set up a log scan and scan it out. So it's going to be a one pass uh, transfer of your film. So there's not like we do three to one in color corrected on the M2. We'll be doing one to one when we're doing data scanning. So three minutes of film will take three minutes to transfer? That's correct. Wow even at those big file sizes. That's correct. But how long is it going to take to then download that data onto a hard drive? Well, a big part of uh, the new scanning system is working on that part of it, okay. it, is being able to access that data. So partially, um, uh, one thinking right now is to not land that footage on our own system, but to land it directly onto a hard drive. Mm. So instead of transferring it and putting it on our server, and then downloading it to your hard drive, you'd provide a hard drive that was fast enough to be compatible with our scanner, like something with a Thunderbolt connection, 
and we would scan your pictures directly to your hard drive. Got there it. would be no downloading it. It would be loaded from the scanner, not downloaded later. So then it would be the client's responsibility to immediately do their own backup and things like that because we wouldn't have it on our server for a couple of weeks while yeah, they were playing with it. And we and we probably we might have to not um, you know, you would have to provide a higher speed, you know, hard drive and you might have to just get those from us because um, we we can't just plug in people's hard drives because right. it would crash the whole system sure, if there was a sure. bug in someone's hard drive right. doing it that way. Yeah. So we may not be able to accept right. other people's hard drives. Right, right. That uh, makes sense. We may use our own high speed hard drive here, dump it to our own Thunderbolt drive, and then go over to another computer and download it to your Western digital rink, you know, uh, yeah. kind of thing, right? So so we may be able to provide that as a service, but for the most efficient kind of transferring, you would, you know, we would set you up with a high-speed drive, and we would just dump the entire resolution of the picture directly onto your drive. So okay. it would be much more efficient, much, you know, much faster here in the lab, right? Um, and therefore, less expensive for the customer. I mean, we'll be able to do 2K and 4K resolution probably for less money than we currently do high definition resolution. Right, right. So let's talk about consumer home movies for a minute and how this new system would affect them. Okay. Most consumers are not going to want to color correct their own film. And I'm assuming, at least right now at this point, most of them get overwhelmed just by the thought <laughs> of editing it or having it on a hard drive as opposed to DVDs. Uh -huh. right? And one of the things that we've always said is great about our older scanners is that the Y-Front technology, as you said a little while ago, does soften dirt and scratches and artifacts. So, you know, if the whole movie collection is not being used for, say, a documentary or something theatrical or something, you know, for broadcast, um, is this system still a, a good system for them? Can we call it correct if, if, if we want to off the log scanner or no? Well, um, the scanning part and the correcting part are now going to be totally separate. Okay. So, will Pro 8 Millimeter, the company, expand their operations to doing post color correction? Possibly. Um, will we provide other services off the scan, like dirt and scratch concealment, which is a software driven program now, not a physical driven program, like with the Y front? So, when we're using the Y front, we're using optical technology to to reduce the scratches. But there's lots of ways of reducing the dirt and scratches done digitally as a as a digital process. So will we, as a company, Pro Eight Millimeter, like provide dirt and scratch removal for footage or image stabilization for footage or um, format outputting? Because uh, a lot of things run on different, you know. One thing we will be able to do with the new scanner is output directly to AVI, for example, files, which are much more PC-friendly. Um, I was going to say, I thought that was a term of the past, AVI. I didn't know anybody even used AVI anymore. Well, in our world of mostly Mac, nobody does. But in the world of PC, and 90% of the world uses PC, AVI is king. Mm -hmm. So we don't support it because we don't have the encoders and all that kind of peripheral equipment to support AVI, but the new scanner will. We'll be able to support uh, things like uh, Ultra 16. Ultra 16 is a funny little formatting version of 16 millimeter where they actually frame the picture in between the sprocket holes of 16 millimeter so that they can make a wider image on a standard piece of 16 millimeter film. This is very complicated for our traditional scanners to scan this thing called Ultra 16 because the way the scanners work, uh, they don't like the, the light that goes through the sprocket holes and so they have to block uh, that light. Mm -hmm. um, so in a typical, in our scanning, we don't, we, we have a lot of difficulty in showing the sprocket holes and showing like what's around the sprocket hole. In this scanning, you can show the sprocket holes, and that, that's why you can overscan it, and that's why you can do things like Ultra 16. Right, right. It also grabs the entire frame and all the information that's on the entire frame, 
which in things like optical sound for 16 millimeter, that's actually a picture on the side of the film. And that fil that's read by something. Well, guess what? If you scan over the whole frame, you also scan the entire soundtrack. So you can capture the optical track at the same time as you transfer the picture. That so was going to be my next question. So right? So you can, you, can, um, you can maintain all the audio values as a part of the scan. Mm -hmm. um, we'll scan not only 8, not only 16, but 35 millimeter film. We'll be able to scan 35 millimeter film on this scanner because it's a simple replacement of the head for 35 millimeter production. So um, we'll have access to optical 35, optical 16, ultra 16, you know, and one thing we, we know, uh, having done this and why you have to have a, an eight week course about this stuff is media is, you know, there are the things that were tremendously popular and successful, but then there's all the other stuff right. that a lot of people have that weren't so successful. The 3D, uh, viewing things sure. that, that, that are very important to a lot of people. And so as archivists and as transfer people, um, we're, we're trying to define ourselves as those who can deal with all this obscurity and conform that obscurity into digital um, that everyone can share. So we want to be able to handle uh, a micro MV uh, video format, which was very unique, very, not very popular, uh, but some people have it, you mm -hmm. know, like Polar Vision 8mm uh, film, a right. very obscure thing, right. um, a crappy image, uh, mm -hmm. on the. but some people's archive contain this Polar Vision uh, pictures, and, and those are worthwhile uh, things to try to save. So this scanner, because it scans over the entire frame, can scan more than just the picture. And, and some of those things uh, are things uh, that people want to use. Uh, you were talking a little bit about the sound and optical track. What about if they have separate mag full coat? Um, well, we'll probably still run full coat on our mag dubber because we have a dedicated 16 millimeter mag full coat dubber. Um, so that, that was a dedicated piece of machinery. They do have an option for the scanner so you can dub full coat on, on their scan, but uh, it, it, we've already got that system set mm -hmm. up, so I don't think that we'd, we'd select that option uh, for their system. Um, another part of the scanner that's kind of unique is that it, uh, the way that it stabilizes picture. I was going to ask about that. Uh, in our traditional scanners, we use something called edge-guided sprocket. Um, it uses a sprocket wheel to tell the scanner where the frame is, and it uses the edge of the film to guide where the picture is put. This scanner uses the sprocket hole completely as the thing to uh, orientate where the frame goes in the digital. So it uses a, a two, basically a 2D optical pin registration system. So it's registering each frame in the transfer based on the sprocket hole which has some incredible advantages in terms of uh, stability based on the footage. So we may find that it can produce much more stable pictures uh, from some footage. Uh, and because we haven't really experimented with it that much, we, we don't know whether it will cause some problems as well. Okay. So it may be that that doesn't, saw, doesn't do a better job for everything. So we will still have the other scanners for, for that kind of situations. But um, I've seen some of the stable stability tests, and uh, it's incredible how stable a picture can be uh, made on this scanner using uh, an optical uh, pin registration system. Right. So let's talk about it. I just saw some test footage of our new Logmark camera, mm -hmm. which is uh, still in beta test, but you know it's phenomenal what these guys have done. And... Um, the test footage was transferred log, correct? Right. So it de definitely looks different. It looks very different. But I can't put into words to my eye, it looks different because I've been looking at this stuff with you for so many years. Right. But I can't really put into words what it is. You said something about 
because the new Logmar camera is pin registered and the scanner is pin, pin registered. Right. So um, there's a bunch of things going on there that end up being something that looks different than the way that it used to look. The first thing that's going on there is the pin registration, both in the camera and in the scanner. Now, in the old days, we didn't have pin registered scanners because we didn't have pin registered cameras. So um, it's kind of overkill to have a one or the other be pin registered. But if you have both pin registered, then they should produce a perfectly stable picture, both shot and transferred. So in introducing the Logmar camera as a, a new thing in Super 8, having a pin registered image, you almost have to then commit to having a pin registered scan procedure so that you can take full advantage of the pin registered picture with a pin registered scan. So there's that. Um, there's the log aspect of it. Um, you've probably not seen much Super 8 transferred log and then color timed in post. It makes a different picture. Um, there's a different um, different way the grain looks. Mm. Um, when you spread out the picture um, over the phosphor of the tube that we use uh, typically in scanning versus spreading out the picture digitally after it's been log scanned. Uh, there's a very different looking look yes. to uh, what the pictures look like log scanned, color timed in Final Cut versus color timed on the scanner and transferred color time. So you're looking at the pin registration, you're looking at the log scan, you're looking at something that's gone out to 2K versus HD. So you've got a bunch of values there. Uh, which thing is affecting which thing the most? Well, that's the ex that's the excitingness of the scanner, of getting the new scanner. is like figuring all this out and knowing, well, under these conditions, this would be better, and under those conditions, that would be better. But, uh, you know, seeing which improvements, uh, you know, and I, I've done quite a few tests already with the scanner. I wouldn't go out and buy this thing without having to, I, I, I put a bunch of reels together that I was very familiar with and I'd scan. I scanned them in HG, I've scanned them in SD, and then I sent them out to be log scanned in 2K and did comparisons between the different methods and stuff like that. So there's tremendous... Um, new possibilities doing it this way. Um, I'll just say it that way because and whether transferring footage that was shot in a non pin registered camera in a pin registered scanner, whether that makes huge improvements or not, possibly. I did do some non pin registered pictures shot in a Canon 1014 log scan with the scanner. They looked amazing. You know, the stability was just out of this world. So there may be things, you know, that that you know, values of each, based on shooting, based on scanning, that that add up to uh, all this new thing. But I think what's exciting is to be able to create new pictures out of eight millimeter film that that have never been seen before. That things that you know, it's just like getting a new stock. You know, you like all of a sudden there's a new material to expose onto it, and the pictures look radically different because the stock is different. Well, this is going to make radical difference in the way that these older stocks look. One question I have is that a lot of times when people send in stuff to be transferred, they have a preconceived notion of what they think it should look like. Mm -hmm. So what is going to be the learning curve of the client who has in their head the way they think it should look? Because log scanning is just getting out into the market. I mean, is it going to look more like stuff they're shooting on their digital cameras? Well, because the grain is going to be so much tighter, or is it going to still retain the look of film? It will still retain the look of film. But I think a lot of the other professionals in the in the world are also working in the same uh, kind of value sense. They just call it different things. They call it raw. Okay. So you can shoot still photography or videography in raw mode in your camera. And what raw is, is the digital's stills version of log okay all right so people are out there shooting their digital cameras in raw mode and color timing them in post-production this is a, a an accepted method of digital shooting and people see the benefits of their raw exposures 
being post-color time versus the camera trying to color time the picture while they shoot it. So um, this is really the exact same kind of principles that we're working with. We're just, we just call it log as a function of motion picture film, which is already a log curved image um, and, and pulling from the traditions of motion picture. And this is what they call it. You know, if you're shooting a digital camera, you call it raw. If you're shooting a motion picture, you call it log. So it's really the same thing. Uh, and so all the picture taking people out there in the world and the processors are all working in these same goals. We're not doing something like completely unique out here in Super 8 land. And far from it. We're, we're the opposite. We're always trying to take the obscurity of Super 8 and standardize it so that people in the real world can accept images shot on Super 8 in their current projects. Sure. I mean, a big part of doing 4K, for example, 4K will not improve one iota the resolution of anything in 8 millimeter. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just way beyond what the resolution of 8 millimeter film can offer. But if you're doing a 4K project, an Ultra HD project, which you know is going on, you know, everywhere in the country right now, people are starting to produce in Ultra HD to fill up all these millions of 4K television, Sony and all those guys have been selling, right? right? I mean, the TVs are out there, but the programming hasn't hit, right? Exactly. So, like anything, they always put the cart before the horse. Right. So which, you know, which comes first? Does the hardware get there first or the software? Well, the hardware is there and the software isn't. So documentarians, people who are making theatrical kind of releases, people who are doing things are looking to work in 4K. So if that's what you're doing, you want to get your 8 millimeter film into the game, you have to take it to 4K. Or if you want to put an 8 millimeter scene in your 4K movie, well, you don't want to go through transferring 8 millimeter to SD and then bumping the SD up to 2K and then bumping the 2K up to 4K. You want to take your 8 millimeter film, put it in 4K, and take advantage of all the things that 4K has to offer directly from the film and not having to absorb the problems of those intermediate formats. Like, for example, if you take film and transfer it SD, you convert it to 60 fields, you convert it to interlace, and then if you take that SD and try to make it HD, you're incorporating all of the deficiencies of SD in your HD version of it. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you took the film and then you just retransferred it to HD, you're going straight from the picture right to the output and not picking up any of the crap that the intermediate format is going to throw in. So we'll do the exact same thing in 4K. We'll be able to take an 8 millimeter piece of film and put it right into 4K, right the way you want to use it, without any intermediary framing or resolution or interlacing format, you know, whatever crap. Is, is a part of that intermediate system will go direct. And this, this is really important. Okay, so we're going to be going to commercial break in a minute. So I'm only going to ask you this question now if you can answer quickly. So after this transfer is done, um, it's going to be on someone's hard drive. Are they going to like drag those big files onto their desktop? I mean, how are people, how are they going to show them? Well, in Thunderbolt based systems, the, 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 hard drive outside your computer is faster than the hard drive in your computer. Okay. So in in Thunderbolt editing, you never bring anything onto your laptop. It always just stays on your hard drive. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. And if you really, you're doing things like 4K and, and color correcting and things like that, usually you're going one drive to another drive and your computer's in between. Okay. So you take the images from one hard drive and you work with them and you send them out to another hard drive. They never live on your computer. Only the program lives on your computer. And they just move from one drive to the other. And that's the only way to get the kind of throughput speed that you can that you need to work in things like, you know, full 4K. Smart. Don't go away, everybody. You're listening to the Home Movie Legacy Project. We'll be back after this break. I love to take a photograph So I'm 
Raising the consciousness as to why home movies are so important. This is the Home Movie Legacy Project with Rhonda Vigent. And we'll be back with more right after these on Rockstar Worldwide. Stand up and speak up with host Walt Grassel. Sharing stories of people who have taken steps to overcome their fears and now lead stronger, more fulfilling lives. Are you ready to take that first step towards a different life? Join Walt as he shares his tales of triumph over stage fright in public speaking. Walt has performed stand-up comedy at the Hollywood Improv, as well as the Flamingo in Las Vegas, and wants to help you conquer whatever is holding you back. Join him and his guests for Stand Up and Speak Up every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern, right here on Rockstar Worldwide and on demand 24-7. Rockstar Worldwide from Double Wide Productions. If you are a family historian passionate about preserving and sharing family films and stories, a filmmaker wanting to move analog, legacy, or found footage into a digital project or documentary, a genealogy buff, memory keeper, or archivist, this show is for you. The Home Movie Legacy Project. Rhonda's passion for home movies and independent filmmaking stems from running Pro 8 mm based in Burbank, known as the Super 8 experts for production and legacy footage for over 30 years. They have worked on thousands of projects for moguls and the masses, including Hollywood blockbusters such as Argo, Super 8, and JFK, TV shows, music videos, commercials, and the personal family film legacy of the world's most famous faces, industry icons, award-winning documentaries, and archival footage for the presidential libraries and museums. Each show will focus on compelling interviews with people who are telling their personal stories using home movies as a jumping off point, sharing what was discovered, or what was challenged, or what was confirmed. Expert guests will share best practices to organize, digitize, socialize, and even monetize your old media formats and cutting edge ways to bring them back into your digital life. And don't miss the weekly Tech Talk segment featuring Phil Vigent, the other half of the Pro 8mm story. Learn insider industry secrets of how to become head of your own studio. Don't miss the Home Movie Legacy Project, Thursdays at 7 p.m. Eastern on Rockstar Worldwide. Welcome back to the Home Movie Legacy Project, showcasing compelling interviews with people who are telling their personal stories. Rhonda is all about preserving our visual heritage for generations to come before it's too late. So let's get back to the show. It's the Home Movie Legacy Project on Rockstar Worldwide. And here again is your host, Rhonda Vigent. And welcome back to the last segment of the show today where we're talking about uh, trends in scanning, uh, moving your film uh, into your digital life and some new options that are now available. So, Phil, we've been talking today about log scanning and that we're going to be getting one of these puppies here at Pro 8 Millimeter. How soon is that going to happen? Uh, it's on order. They said uh, four to six weeks. So uh, I think it could be installed here, you know, sometime in July. Um, probably be up and doing transfers uh, probably in August. That's cool. So um, what is the first thing that we need to do to prepare for this, to prepare our staff, to prepare our clients? I mean, obviously, you got to figure out what you're going to charge people, um, you know, get some other, you know, basics in place in terms of what kind of hard drives we're going to use. I mean, how are we going to launch this? Uh, um, I, I have a pretty good idea, you know, where we're heading with the whole thing. I just have to see it all come together in terms of being able to achieve the goals that I have set for the thing. Because one thing, of course, that's important is to try to drive the price down in terms of, uh, you know, if people are going to be required to do some of the work themselves, right. you know, they should be getting the benefit of, uh, you know, having... Um, you know, uh, less expensive, you know, because we can do it less expensively, um, then they they can take advantage of that. You know, I'm hoping, you know, we I rough out Super 8 film transfers at about a buck a foot, you know, so you're paying about $50 to do a high-def, scene-to-scene, color-corrected uh, roll of Super 8. And that, that's kind of a premium, um, you know, in my opinion, after 40 years of doing this stuff, uh, what should be done to make it look as good as it can look, you know? So a buck a foot is kind of, you know, my benchmark of, of doing this whole thing. Uh, I'm hoping I can get the log scanning done to like, you know, 75 cents a foot or even less so mm -hmm. that 
uh, people can can do their work less expensively in terms of the scanning, uh, but they have to gonna, they're going to have to understand that they got to do some of the work. Now, sure. some of the people out there are already well embraced in the work and they, they love it and they want it that way. Right. And they, they're 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 unhappy with me color correcting it right now. Right, right. I have to color correct it log for them. <laughs> it's like uh, it's the opposite. They just want the raw, and they, I think there's more and more people. Uh, filmmakers who want the raw, you know, they want to be able to do this manipulation, and they have fabulous programs. We just talked about Final Cut. I mean, that's just the tip of the iceberg. That's just an edit program that has uh, uh, color correcting in it. You have things like DaVinci color correcting that you can buy for. Uh, you can use the free one uh, up there. It's called DaVinci Light. You can use it for free, you know, mm -hmm. to color correct, or you can buy the thousand dollar version, which gives you just endless. Right, amounts right. of capacity. So I'm always correct. thinking about my little bit more amateur editors, like my Apo, APO uh -huh. people. So they could, if they wanted to, could use DaVinci Light with oh, their yeah. with their Mac. Oh, absolutely. Or would they still have to have Final Cut X? No, they just use it directly with the. Uh, wow, it's a free program. It's free. Free. Right. And it works pretty good. It's got a pretty oh, good yeah. range of options. Oh my god, killer kind of capacity Amazing. to do color correction, and and all these plugins for all this other stuff. You know, the plugins for dirt and scratch, the plugins for stabilization, the plugins for flicker. The this, you know, there's there's a lot of stuff that's been dedicated to the motion picture business that's been very expensive for a long time. Right. It's now all becoming sort of computer based software driven app orientated kinds mm -hmm. of stuff where some of these companies are you know like i say like with da vinci literally giving away an intro version of the thing mm -hmm. so that you can see the power these right. things have over your images and and you'll you'll see how good it is and then you'll want to get the the full up version you know because it's it's so fantastic so you know, there's there's just literally hundreds of software companies out there competing yeah. for the billions of computers out there. So, you know, when we think about film and and we love our traditions, but we also want to integrate film into the modern world. Sure. And we want to place film on the table of modern creative people. Sure. And if what they're doing is playing on their Mac with color correction and framing, then we just want to give them the raw essence of what film is so that they can have at it uh, with their software you know driven world and create some wonderful you know new new things uh, you know incorporating uh, film origination uh, rather than trying to build all these stupid software programs to try mm -hmm. to impersonate film uh, yes. I think if we make film accessible to them they'll just go for the real they'll right. just like why bother? R -E -E -L. <laughs> yeah, just why? Why bother trying to create this scratching on a piece of film sure. when I could go out and get a Super 8 camera and shoot the damn thing myself and have a, you know, people like love to imitate it, you know, and try to, you know, but it always looks like imitation. Well, if the real isn't that much more expensive, really, then I think a lot of those people will choose to use it real rather than try to fake it. I agree. Well, technology is both exciting and exhausting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I'm really glad you were here today to get us ready for this next technological move that our, you know, uh, counterparts in in the professional industry are already doing. And you know, the uh, home hobbyist, amateurist, do you know, do it yourself or will follow, as inevitably they do. Yep. Thank you so much for being on the Home Movie Legacy Project today, Phil. And everybody, that's a wrap. We'll see you next week. Make it a good one. Thank you for being part of the Home Movie Legacy Project with your host, Rhonda Vidjid, here on Rockstar Worldwide. Each week, you'll learn how to take an oral history and a compelling story that will make your great-great-grandkids laugh and make your parents feel young again and get that Generation Y interested in their family tree. This is a different kind of reality show, one that is revealed through the stories and frames shot long ago. So you can shift your focus, transform your understanding, and move forward in your life. The Home Movie Legacy Project. For more on Rhonda and the show, check out our website, homemovielegacy.com. 
Then be here next week as the journey continues. The Home Movie Legacy Project with Rhonda Vincent. Thursday evenings at 7 Eastern here on Rockstar Worldwide.